Ideas have consequences. Events are not born in isolation. Ideas when given life become events. Far too often, we limit our vision to what we see and hear and don't make any effort to trace back to the ideas behind the events. An abstract germ of an idea can lead man to land a robot on a comet or it can lead to a disaster. Bhopal gas tragedy was not a mere accident. What happened on one night in December of 1984 was a culmination of ideas. Here is one such idea. The enormity of the tragedy of Bhopal, India is becoming more apparent this morning. Authorities now say the toxic gas that escaped from a Union Carbide plant on Monday has killed at least 1,600 people, and they say another 50,000 people may suffer serious after effects. These are simply hellish. So much suffering from India's invisible killer. At one point, an official said one death was being recorded every minute from the poison gas leak in the city of Bhopal. At 5 past 12 on December 3, 1984, in the city of Bhopal, events that had been set in motion years earlier, culminated in the worst industrial disaster in history. A dense cloud of lethal gas escaped into the city's atmosphere from Union Carbide India Limited's pesticide factory. Aided by the cold winter night, it turned the sleeping city into a vast gas chamber. As they began inhaling the toxic fumes, people ran on the streets, vomiting and dying. As families fled their homes, parents and children were separated in the dark of the night, infants and the elderly were forgotten and left behind. Many died in their beds. Hospitals were flooded with patients. But nobody knew much about the toxin or its antidote. The city of lakes, as it is known, was overflowing with dead bodies. The night witnessed human misery at a scale never seen before. Number of killed could only be guessed by the amount of wood and cloth supplied for cremation. According to some estimates, 15,000 people got killed and over 600,000 workers affected. But no one will ever know the exact number. What caused this disaster? Who lit the fire that claimed countless lives and resulted in unspeakable suffering? The story of Bhopal till now has only been told as the story of human misery, but it is as much a story of the ideas that caused it. Almost everyone believes the cause of the accident was a profit-seeking corporation, in the face of losses, blatantly ignored government-mandated safety regulations. The colonial narrative seeks the people to believe that an American-owned company hardly valued the lives of third-world people. That Warren Anderson knew just how dangerous the gas used in Bhopal really was. Methyl isocyanate is considered so dangerous that no company in America uses it. It was used in India only because it is much cheaper than the alternative. In intellectual circles, they hold this disaster as an example of unregulated capitalism. Bhopal marked the horrific beginning of a new era, one that signaled the collapse of restraint on corporate power, wrote one Indian intellectual. Was this all to the event considered to be one of the worst industrial disasters ever? How could a company, which had safety first as its motto be so irresponsible? 
How come there weren't any eyebrow raising accidents at Union Carbide's seven plant in Virginia, similar in design with the Bhopal plant but which was at least seven times bigger? Kamal Parikh, a young Indian engineer sent to America for training, marveling at the work ethic and comprehensive safety mechanisms in place at the Virginia plant once said. It was a pleasure working with those American engineers. They were so professional, so attentive to details, whereas we Indians often have a tendency to overlook them. If they weren't satisfied, they wouldn't let us move on to the next stage. For weeks on end, we made a concerted effort with our American colleagues to imagine every possible incident, and its consequences. So, for a company so immaculate in its approach, how did they let this tragic accident happen? What led to the fall in the operating standards and safety precautions when it came to the Bhopal plant? If there are bigger ideological issues at play, what are they? The substance central to the tragedy was methyl isocyanate, or MIC. All right. This is the formulation of a chemical some of us in Union Carbide call liquid dynamite. But you know of it as? Methyl isocyanate, sir. MIC. Indeed. And what do we know of its stability? Sir, when cool, fine. But when heated, very dangerous. And what's the most dangerous way of heating it? When in contact with water, sir. Correct. Its reaction when in contact with water is especially violent. MIC is a highly toxic compound with a very low boiling point and can only be stored in stainless steel jars. On reaction with water, it violently releases toxic gases, which is what happened on the unfortunate night. So the question naturally is why did Union Carbide have to set up a plant of such toxic nature in the first place? On the contrary to the perception that UCC was in India to make a quick buck, its association with India had been a very long one. Until the tragedy struck, the year 1984 had been a special one for Union Carbide. It was celebrating its 50th anniversary in India. 1934 was the year when Union Carbide Corporation first started its operations in the British India. Starting off with importing and selling batteries, they eventually set up a battery manufacturing plant and became a household name under the brand Everready Batteries. Red Ever Ready, the chosen one for your transistor. With India's independence in 1947, the whole industrial and business atmosphere changed. The industrial policy resolutions of 1948 and 1956, Jawaharlal Nehru, as the Prime Minister, laid out the pattern of a socialist economy, espousing the middle path between public and private enterprise. This allowed the government to interfere and encroach without restraint, on the freedoms of the private industry. To add to this, the Congress government inspired by Swadeshi philosophy, curtailed foreign investment in India. And by coercive insistence on technology transfer, regardless of domestic human resource capabilities, they dissuaded movement of innovation into India. Where technology is available in India, it must be preferred to foreign technology. All technology, once imported into India, is Indian technology. It should not be paid for beyond a period of five years. Industrial Policy, 1948 
As a result in 1956, following the Companies Act enacted that year, Union Carbide Corporation was forced to sell off 40% of its holding in its Indian subsidiary, most of which was bought by Indian government through public sector units. It thus became Union Carbide India Limited UCIL. At the time of the accident, the government of India was directly and indirectly holding 49% of shares in UCIL. Back in the US, around the same time, UCC's scientists, after years of rigorous research, created a chemical compound called Carbaryl. Carbaryl is commercially sold under the brand name Seven. Its chief use is of an insecticide. Carbaryl has been around for a long time, uh, developed by, I think, Union Carbide in 1958. Wow. The third <laughs> most used insecticide in the United States. The, wow, the trade right. name was Seven, seven. for years yeah. and years. It was Seven and Seven. The most popular pesticide at that time, DDT, had gradually become ineffective against pests, and was also seen as harmful to humans. With the invention of Carbaryl, the quest for an effective but non-toxic pesticide came to an end. To prove its harmlessness to humans, photographs flashed in newspapers of UCC's scientists tasting a few granules of the compound. But, uh, for, it's, 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 not a restricted use pesticide. You know, you follow the label, follow the label. and, and yes. it will take care of. A, a, still, still commonly recommended for a lot of the chewing insects. I think squash bugs. MIC, the substance that caused havoc in Bhopal, is one of the main ingredients in Seven. It is barely believable that such an innocuous substance could be manufactured from a deadly toxin. Seven's huge success in rescuing Egypt's cotton crop in 1961, which averted an economic disaster for the country, catapulted it to worldwide popularity. Nineteen sixties India was reeling under food shortages, so much so that Lal Bahadur Shastri had to call upon all Indians to fast once in a week. How serious is this food shortage going to be in the spring? I think it's still difficult to give a definite answer because if it rains, it should rain now in January. And if it rains, it does help a bit. Uh, but of course we are getting food from outside and I think that might tide us over the really difficult period. Under Public Law 480, the United States, through the Red Cross, donated 870 metric tons of seven to assist India's quest for self-sufficiency in food production in their Green Revolution. Taking this as an opportunity, UCIL expanded its operations into the agricultural sector through pesticides. After taking relevant permissions from the Indian government, UCIL initially started importing technical grade 7 from the US, diluted it with local inert agents, packaged and then sold it across India. For importing 7, USIL was required to pay UCC in US dollars. However there was a severe dollar shortage in India at that time. The dollar shortage issue is not some unknown or unexplainable phenomena. It is indicative of the fact that rupee was overvalued vis-a-vis -vis the dollar. When a currency is overvalued by decree, people rush to exchange it for the undervalued currency at the bargain rates, this causes a surplus of overvalued currency and a shortage of the undervalued currency. The rate, in short, is prevented from moving to clear the exchange market. In the present world, foreign currencies have generally been overvalued relative to the dollar. The result has been the famous phenomenon of the dollar shortage. Murray Rothbard, 1961. As a result of this, one needed permission from RBI to even travel abroad. Added to that, 
The Indian government's protectionist policies did not look favorably on USIL's dependence on imported seven, and pressurized the company to produce it locally. Even though UCC had operations in 38 countries, Bhopal's was its only seven plant outside the US. Had it not been for these web of governmental controls and convoluted policies, there wouldn't have been any need to establish this high-risk plant in India. As it would prove later, the cost of producing seven locally was three and a half times it cost to import from the US. Based on the Planning Commission's demand projections, which themselves are based on faulty statistical models of the National Sample Survey Organization, USIL applied for government's permission to set up a plant to produce 5,000 mount of seven every year in Bhopal, India. While the government gave its permission to set it up, it also gave itself an important role to play by imposing a host of conditions. 7. The trade name for the insecticide carbaryl is produced by reacting alpha naphthol with MIC in a process called carbamylation. Broadly, this required an alpha naphthol manufacturing unit, a MIC manufacturing unit and a carbamylation unit. However, UCC was not keen on building an alpha naphthol manufacturing unit because the only major use of alpha naphthol was the manufacture of seven insecticide. Also seven had been in the market for over 12 years. Insects slowly adapt themselves to insecticides, making them ineffective and thus UCC planned to replace seven within next five to eight years. Their research and development department was already in possession of several replacement molecules. None of them required alpha naphthol. UCL, therefore, thought it was unnecessary to build an alpha naphthol plant when it could just import it for a fraction of the cost. They detailed all this in a letter to the government in the July of 1970. However, the politicians and the bureaucrats thought otherwise and political decisions came to replace rational business and scientific decisions. They insisted UCIL develop a local technology to manufacture alpha naphthol in their reply. Lack of indigenous expertise meant the plant never came to be built, and thus the fiasco ended with millions of dollars being burnt to no avail. In 1974, to assert the idea of Indianization even more, the Indira Gandhi government enacted Foreign Exchange Regulation Act. This act would further curtail foreign investors and their equity in Indian subsidiaries. It even restricted and controlled the employment of non-resident and foreign nationals in India. As a result, UCIL had to kowtow to the government every time they needed to keep a foreign expert at the plant. Under this act, a new set of rules were framed to decrease the share in the equity of foreign holders. This led to UCC decreasing its holding from 60 to 50.9%. Because of the tyranny they unleashed, most foreign companies shut their Indian subsidiaries. Nearly 40% of the companies shut their Indian operations between 1973 and 1980. This included companies like IBM and Coca-Cola, which were forced to reveal their trade secrets. For the MIC plant, UCIL was given permission to import the design from UCC but all the aspects of construction of the plant were mandated to be indigenous. UCC was kept at an arm's length during detailed designing and implementation. Hence, UCC, in its design transfer agreement legally absolved itself of all responsibility in case of any mishap. 
Had there been no out-of-court settlement, this disclaimer would have been in prime focus and UCC could have gotten away without paying even a single penny in compensation. In the late 1970s, the Indian government gave incentives to small manufacturers to produce second-grade, less effective pesticides, which they sold at half the price of seven. Parallelly the government also gave farmers subsidies to buy these pesticides. All this resulted in selling of less than 1,000 metric tons of seven, while the Bhopal plant was designed to produce five times that amount based on the Planning Commission's projections. This, like many other incidents, proved the futility of centralized planning of an economy. In a nation of a billion people, when each individual undertakes independent economic action or inaction, like even the small act of drinking a cup of tea, affects the economy. It is impossible for a single central authority to decide and predict the movement of the economy. USIL should have done its own market research but it was not possible when the government was dictating its every move. The Bhopal operation was never profitable for USIL. In 1984, the plant incurred a loss of 4 million US dollars, resulting in skilled workers leaving for greener pastures. Even the existing employees started losing morale. The final link between USIL and UCC was Warren Wooma. He was a fine engineer who had trained Indian engineers at the Virginia plant and was appointed as the workers' manager, who was responsible for the safety of the plant from 1980, when the Mike plant started operation, to 1982. In 1982, as per fairer Indianization policy, he was sent back by the Indian government, after which USIL gradually lost interest in running the plant and started contemplating on shutting it down. Also the government asked the USIL to end all the foreign collaboration with the UCC as soon as possible. The interim extension given by the government for UCC USIL collaboration was to end in January 1985. The accident happened in December, 1984. UCIL had to replace Wooma with a senior manager from UCIL's Kolkata battery manufacturing unit who was given the task of plugging losses at the Bhopal plant. He, being from an unrelated background, had no knowledge about the hazardous nature of the chemicals he was handling. As a part of the cost-cutting measures, slowly, one by one, the safety precautions were neglected. Even with respect to the original Virginia plant design of which the Bhopal plant was Indianized, a lot of automation was bypassed under the pretext of creating jobs, which left room for human error. Systems that were meant to automatically shut down operations were replaced by workers who could not even read the safety manuals which were in English. When land was first allotted to UCC for establishing the Seven plant, there were none of the slums or the shanty towns in the area. As time passed and the city grew, the people moved to settle in the precincts of the factory. Disregarding UCIL management's complaints, the local governments regularized those slums by giving out ownership rights, for the sake of votes, with promise of water and electricity connections. When opposition parties in the assembly questioned the safety of the people living in the slums, the relevant minister was complacent in his reassurance. On the ill-fated night, water entered the tank E610, which held 42 tons of MIC, producing the toxic gases which ended the lives of thousands of people. There were conflicting theories on how this exactly happened. Government and UCC set up their own investigations. UCC, after research, came up with a sabotage theory, where it believed that a rogue employee purposefully did this. The government rejected it but couldn't conclusively prove otherwise. 
The government's theory of malfunctioning equipment resulting in leakage of water into the MIC tank couldn't be replicated when the government's scientific research body, CSIR, conducted experiments at the factory. NK Singh Commission set up by the state government was shut down abruptly when the government suspected it implicated that the state government, the union government and UCIL all shared the blame equally. But all this is irrelevant. This plant was dicing with death. The disaster was impending. Simply put, this was a government-controlled explosion. The disaster was the direct result of government-choking businesses. To quote Robert Bidinotto who through his New York Times article in 1985 first brought to light the government's direct hand in the tragedy. Under, India's, industrial policy, business and government are seen as partners in joint ventures to promote national goals. What does business bring to such a partnership? Basically, every creative element, vision, ideas, effort, know-how, capital. What does the government bring to such a partnership? Basically, every coercive element, favors, dispensations, subsidies and other carrots for politically approved businesses, on the one hand, and on the other, prohibitions, regulations, punitive taxes and other sticks against politically unpopular businesses. When human ingenuity touched a deadly toxin, a world-renowned insecticide materialized. When the same toxin was let open for political and bureaucratic meddling, it vaporized into a poisonous gas that caused one of the world's worst industrial disasters. The most brazen aspect of this whole fiasco was the passage of the Bhopal Gas Leak Disaster Act, which conferred on the central government, which directly held nearly 25% equity in the UCIL, which micromanaged UCIL, the powers to sue UCC on behalf of the affected people. How can the perpetrator of the crime, the government, become the guardian for the victims of the crime? It is an obvious case of conflict of interest and prima facie the legislation itself appears to be a denial of due process. Every action of which any government should be ashamed is concealed by converting it into an official secret to be protected from public scrutiny and exposure. Ram Jet Malani. What followed was even more sinister. As a sovereign country instead of setting up its own tribunal to determine the compensation, the Indian government sued UCC in an American court. Because the government viewed it would get better compensation in an American court than in an Indian one. When UCC objected to the forum chosen by the Indian government to sue them, the government responded by saying that Indian courts were not competent to handle such a case. This prompted a response from Indian jurist Nani Polkivala, who filed an affidavit against the government's view. In short, the government Indianized the American plant, and Americanized Indian judicial obligation. Justice Keenan, the American court judge, rejected Indian government plea to entertain the lawsuit by saying, in the court's view to retain the litigation in this forum, as plaintiff's request, would be yet another example of imperialism, another situation in which an established sovereign inflicted its rules, its standards and values on a developing nation. This court declines to play such a role. The Union of India is a world power in 1986, and its courts have the proven capacity to meet out fair and equal justice. To deprive the Indian judiciary of this opportunity to stand tall before the world and to pass judgment on behalf of its own people would be to revive a history of subservience and subjugation from which India has emerged. After the litigation moved to India, the Supreme Court, in view of the pressing urgency to provide immediate and substantial relief to victims of the disaster, proposed an overall settlement between the parties covering all litigations and claims arising out of the disaster. 
As part of the settlement, UCC agreed to pay 715 crores. The court ordered that all current and future civil and criminal litigation would stand quashed on payment of the agreed sum. The terms of the Memorandum of Settlement passed by the Supreme Court were agreed upon by the Union of India and UCC and UCIL, in a joint statement filed in the court. But the saga didn't end there. After a change of government and unrelenting pressure from some groups representing the victims, the Supreme Court, went against its own ruling and permitted the criminal case to be reopened. The case continues to this day. This is the real story of Bhopal. It is not about the chemical that escaped into the atmosphere on that fateful night, nor about greedy capitalists. But about how a high-handed, whimsical, command control government can wreck lives while escaping all blame. After the accident, there was a lot of talk about industrial safety standards. To paraphrase Thomas Sowell, the most basic question is not what the best safety standards should be, but who determines them. Should it be the government? The same government which kills hundreds of people every day on the roads that it designs so badly and maintains even worse. Millions of people buy an iPhone not because it has an ISI mark, but because it is an Apple product. Apple has spent billions of dollars to make such a perfect product for profits only. Even if one specimen falls short of their standards, they have a reputation to lose. Is there a better incentive to maintain quality? In a control and command economy such as ours, governments, run by technically illiterate bureaucrats and politicians, have no idea of what is safe. Yet they mandate and manage each aspect of the industry, makes decisions for the individuals while keeping people in dark. What's more dangerous about government safety standards is that they give false sense of safety to its citizenry. No wonder Bhopal plant met all safety standards. In the absence of government safety regulation, a hazardous chemical manufacturing plant will have to convince the people living close to the plant to acquire land. The onus is on the factory to prove they are safe. There will be a market for a third-party service which specializes in safety standards to certify such plants. Like any other governmental institution, such a certifying third-party too can be bribed, but they will be out of the business at the first mistake. Whereas government safety regulatory bodies are immune to any of this. It is not profitable for a factory to be unsafe. Just like many Indian technical experts left the Bhopal plant in exasperation, an unsafe company will find it hard to retain employees. Lawsuits, compensations, none of these are profitable. Whatever may be the reasons for this disaster, UCC's brand value nosedived and the company doesn't even exist anymore. Not being safe is an existential threat for the business in itself. It is profitable for foreign investors to employ local workforce if they are capable of doing the job. Even if there is no capable workforce, it is again in the interest of the foreign investors to build institutions to train local people, if you give them the freedom. Promoting Indian manufacturers by putting artificial restrictions on foreign players is but giving it an undeserved privilege. If you want excellence, privileges will not work. Only competition will.